we're going to uh, work through the rest of the intro to convolutions sheet. There's a lot more to say about convolutions later, but this was a good start. First of all, 2G was where we left off on the previous video. I don't want to put out a put together a proof of this. It's it's almost a, it's a really simple statement. I'll just do an example instead. So here's a function f. Here's a function g, which intentionally chosen to be a simple version of a little window function. Um, but now with not not having area one, and in fact having area six. I guess that should be red. Well, whatever. Um, and I'm going to convolve f star g. And we, if this had been area one, so this had been height one half, it would actually it would exactly been a weighted moving average of f. So for example, this value down here of f star g would window back by two and take the average of these values and get something like here. Well, all it's going to do, this is just six times that function, and it's easy to see that the, the convolution scales up. And in fact, I should, I'll mention that in a second. It's something that's so easy to prove, I didn't even put it on the sheet, but I, maybe I should have, is the linearity of this stuff. Um, and so we'll just take this window, this windowed average, and then multiply it by six. Okay, so this is going to be six times the average of f over this interval two before it. Okay, so it's going to average it, so it's going to have that sort of smoothing property, but it's also just going to make it six times bigger. So it's you know if this if the integral of this other function g is not one, then I can't literally say it's really a moving weighted average. It might be scaled by whatever this integral factor is. But it's still the same idea in my book. Okay, so that's that's the deal with 2G. So yeah, let me mention, things I didn't have people prove in the worksheet, because they're super easy, is, but it really a part of a theme that is really important. You can scale either function by a constant. Really important that C is going to be a constant here. If you double F or double G, you double the convolution trivial from properties of integrals. Almost as trivial from the same properties of integrals is that if I have like f1 plus f2 star g, that's f1 star g plus f2 star g. And the same is true for the second factor. I don't, I don't think I've ever uh, taught this in a way that people were remotely surprised by these, and I think they start using them without ever, we, we don't even discuss it, and it's really clear, so I hope it's pretty clear. Go ahead and prove them for yourselves if you want to. But because it's built out of just multiplication and integration, which are classic linear operations, we have these properties. So it's linear in both inputs. But that, is, but as I say, it's, even though it's easy to prove, super, super important, because all of the context here is looking at what happens when you look at linear operations. It does tell us, that that gives us a hint, that if we're looking at nonlinear differential equations, convolutions might not be nearly as important. But they, they don't totally go away in importance. Okay, so now other properties of convolution, which are wonderful. Um, well, first of all, a bad thing... I guess, if we want to put a moral judgment on it, is that unfortunately, just because you can write this down, it doesn't mean this is always going to give an answer. Whenever we're doing improper integrals, there's a danger that it doesn't, that the integral doesn't converge. Now, there's a deeper, more subtle problem that if these functions, if the individual functions themselves are nasty and not integrable in a local sense, that they're just really wacky functions and horribly discontinuous, the integral might not, might not exist for that reason. And we're going to come back to that. That's the kind of thing we typically ignore in sort of applications-oriented courses, but becomes a bigger deal in theoretical courses. What's an integrable function, what's not? And that's going to lead to what is the definition of an integral and what's the best definition, and eventually we'll... Um, go to the Lebesgue integral if, if we have if we go that far. But what I'm really concerned about right now is not those issues. So I'm thinking of f and g say as like continuous functions. Here's f, here's g. Okay. So far, one of the functions has always uh, had finite support. So let me just put that in here. I, I think I forgot to put that in the um, the PDF. But the support of f this is a really important notion. Is just the set of x in the real line, such that um, f of x is not equal to 0. Now it turns out, for reasons that maybe seem very technical now, but we'll see more and more why this is true, what we do that we do to that is take the closure of that. 
And I don't want to be too technical about that yet, but it just means that we're, if the set is like from minus 3 to 5, not including the endpoints, then we're going to throw in the endpoints. Even if this function is 0 at the endpoints, it's often very good to throw in. So basically throw in endpoints. That's not quite true. That's really the worst, well, the worst HR. Throw in endpoints. Don't let any. Don't let it have any fuzzy boundary, basically. Um, so roughly, you can think of it as just where where the function is not equal to zero. Okay, and we'll talk about the technicalities more later. In particular, I've been doing examples where one of the functions, usually g, has had finite support, support on some bounded interval. So it's looked more like this. So it's zero outside of some nice interval, zero here, zero here. And then that's meant that there's been never been any problem with with convergence. Um, at the at the endpoints at the minus infinity infinity, but it's totally easy to come up with an example where this is going to give you infinity or something that just doesn't exist. Um, the absolute simplest example, if you haven't done three A, pause the video and come up with the absolute simplest example. It's where f and g are equal to one, the constant function. Really not pathological, and just utterly impossible to convolve with each other. You just get infinity for every single answer, no matter what t is. Okay, or let's say f equals one, and g is just about anything that doesn't have finite support, like I don't know, g equals sine t or something like that. Okay, then we're just going to end up trying to integrate sine t, which how? What does that mean? Should it be zero? It kind of averages out to zero. Uh, we're going to come back to that kind of issue. Most of the time, we don't want to try to give a value to that. Okay, so the upshot is, it's not accidental that I was being nice about the supports before. Um, usually, we're going to have to be careful with the supports. And we'll maybe we'll come back to a more detailed cases of uh, how we can get around or how we can make sure it's going to be okay. But the two cases we've seen already are where f and g the very, very first problem in this PDF, they didn't have finite support, but if they're actually both supported on the left, or sorry, on the right-hand side, say, right, it works on the left, too. Suppose they're non-zero only on zero to infinity. In other words, they vanish here, and then they do, do, do their thing. If f and g are both like that, what we saw is that the integral goes from zero to t instead of minus infinity to infinity, and we're fine. Uh, or one has um, a finite support. Well. I really shouldn't say finite support again. I don't want to be too um, technical. I don't want to imply the support is a finite set, like just a few points. Let's say bounded support. That's better. Support in a finite in an interval of finite length. Okay. And then the other one can be as have as big a support as you want. Okay. We'll come back to those issues. Support and especially like bounded support, things like that. It's gonna be very important. Okay. So now Let's look at two really super important properties, commutativity and associativity. F star G equals G star F. That one I'm not going to show on the video. Go to the uh, solutions PDF. Eventually I'll post it. It's not posted yet, sorry, as of this, this recording. Um, it's really easy, and it's easier than what I'm going to show right now, which is com commutativity or associativity. But it uses some of the same tools. I'll just tell you, change variables is all you need to do. Okay, so this guy of t, so we've got a lot of parentheses here, but we'd convolve these two functions to produce a new function, then convolve with another function to produce another function, and then finally, to be explicit about proving all these things, usually you got to get down to cases and say, okay, what is that at some value of t? Okay, so let's unpack the outer uh, convolution first. It's a good example of mostly a sort of follow your nose kind of proof. Unpack the definitions, make everything more explicit, usually the first step in any kind of straightforward kind of a textbook kind of proof, and then, and then see what kind of rule suggests itself. Okay, now we unpack the inner convolution. That's an integral as well. And that's going to be g of, ooh, I need a new dummy variable. I'll just use u because I don't need, I don't really need to use more Greek letters. Okay, now that's going to be t minus ta, but then minus u, and then du, and then d ta. Okay, now I'm going to do a change of variables, because I want to get to something where, what's my goal? It's supposed to be f star, oh, huh, just kidding. You might have thought, what the heck is he doing? I forgot which way I was starting. I'm going to start with this. 
one of those things where you should take a look, you know, watch the, as you're watching the video, see if I make a mistake, because I, I often don't re-record it, and I think it, it's, maybe this is laziness, but I think it's kind of fun, because um, you can see some of my mistakes and see so you can, if you can catch them. What I wanted to get to was this. This is where I want to get to, okay? And I want H just appearing on its own, okay? And so what I want to get to is something where I have, um, where H does not have this complicated behavior. It should be of the form T minus something. Okay, so let's say, let's do a little change of variables. V is tall minus U. That's going to turn that into the correct form. Okay, that's a very simple change of variables. Uh, U is just going to be, ooh, plus U. Ah, I did the same, same mistake, because that's parentheses like that. Tall plus U. So then U is tall minus V. And um, the change of variables factor is 1. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and move this inside, because I can. It's just a constant as far as u is concerned. So it's a double integral. And then I got f of tau. Now g, I need to change the variables. Okay, that's tau minus v. I'm sorry. Um, v equals tau plus u. Ooh, I'm just not seeing it on my cheat sheet here. I just want to get the signs right. V equals tau plus u. No, this is v minus tau. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I don't like to make multiple mistakes in one video, but oh well. Okay. I just got the wrong sign in my head when I started doing this. Okay, dvd ta. Okay, just a little change of variables so that this is prepared to be what it wants to be when I finally get it into this form. And then whenever you have a double integral, almost always what you're going to do is you're going to switch the order of integration. There's almost no, I don't know, there's almost no uh, double integral construction proof whatever that doesn't involve switching the order. The fancy name for that is Fubini. Often it's called Fubini's theorem in you know a, a basic calculus book. That's a misnomer because people knew that it was you could change the order in in an integral way before Fubini, who's like oh that might even be 20th century, at least late 19th century. Um, but for once, actually, that's going to be a, it's going to actually be an accurate, somewhat accurate way to refer to it because eventually we're going to try to be careful enough and general enough about it that we'll get to. Fubini's version of it, which was a, a pretty sophisticated version of changing variables. Anyway, a little of a side about the terminology. Okay, so this, now I'm going to change, change the order of integration. Now luckily these are both minus infinity to infinity, so the whole real, it's the whole of R2, whole plane. So there's no com complexity about what's the region and how do you re-describe the region. It's often a complexity in this business. Okay, f of ta, I'm just going to rewrite it. And all I need here is to, okay, change the order. Okay, so now I'm going to break it out. The tau, the inner integral, um, is, involves this guy and this guy, but doesn't involve the h. And that was that's the payoff. So I'm going to leave these guys inside the inner integral, d tau. Then all of that, ooh, let me, uh, let me put it in. and put parentheses around that to emphasize it. All of that is integrated against h of t minus v dv. Aha, that's the integral. This is exactly the definition of f star g of v. And this is h of t minus v. Ooh, there's a minus sign there. And we get, that's f star g. Now this is in this order now. All of that of t. And we're done. Now, as I said, Fubini, calling it Fubini, I want to emphasize the fact that this might not work. This change of variables going from dvd tau to dt tau dv, there's cases where that does not work. It is not a guarantee when this is improper. If these functions are anywhere decent, let's say continuous or even like piecewise continuous, and the, it's a proper integral, it always works. It's really rock solid. But improper integrals mean that Fubini is actually pretty pretty sketchy, and we have to be careful. Now that's not too surprising because even to get the, the convolutions to work at all, we just saw a minute ago that that's non-trivial too. Okay, And so the same kind of assumptions that make it easy to guarantee that the convol each individual convolution exists, it turns out will make it possible to say, yes, for Beanie, the change of, of order of integration for these two improper integrals is going to work as well. But 
um, I want to highlight that this is one of our things that we, we want to be careful about. Okay, So part of the way this course is going to work is we're going to build to-do lists, and they might get sort of extensive, um, of things we need to be careful of, changing order of integration in an improper integral. And there's two things I want to always do, if I can remember, whenever we come into this situation. One is, let's prove it. Well, three, I guess. Find the right hypotheses under which it's true, and then prove it under those hypotheses. But then also see that those really are necessary hypotheses by finding a good counterexample. And a counterexample that you might actually maybe encounter in maybe an applications context, not just a totally contrived, weird mathematician's counterexample. Okay, so that's, this is one of our big things, uh, one of our first things on our 2D list to do that. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to break out the last bit uh, of this actually into another video because it's getting a little long.